Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, a horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois, and we have got a great show for you today. We're talking spring lawn care with horticulture educator Richard Henschel, but before we get to Richard and what we should be doing out there in our lawns, we have to introduce our co-host with us every single week. We are joined by local foods educator Katie Parker and Quincy. Hey, Katie. Hey, Chris. How are things in Macomb today? I mean, I know it's spring. We probably complain about this every week on this show, but my goodness, it's cold and wet right now. <laughs> right. It looks yeah. like it's supposed to be in 70 in the 80s this weekend, though, so hopefully it'll shape up a little bit. Yes, yes. You know, we we found that as we get these random bursts of warmth here in the spring, it's so windy. Like, we're, we stay inside just because, yeah, it's it's like 40 it's mile per hour wind miserable yes. to go out yeah and wind yeah yeah so it's it's been rough in my i've i've started lettuce uh you've heard my my trials with lettuce before and it's uh, i set them out too early they're dead uh, i set out another flat it frosted they're dead so i don't I know you just need to head to the grocery store <laughs> So <laughs> rely on that for your lettuce production. Yeah, I I think we're just going to be buying up some pre-grown lettuce, if that's what we'll call it. That. <laughs> or maybe maybe Kim can spare you some. Yes, and someone who I know has got some extra lettuce, hopefully lurking around the garden, horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hi, Ken. Hello, Chris and Katie. The lettuce is finally starting to come up that we seeded. So when I when I thin it out, I can try to save some for you. Well, we'll, uh, I know we'll be down, uh, we'll be putting up a caterpillar tunnel here in a couple of weeks in your neck of the woods. And then I'm doing this traveling baseball thing with my family. So I'll be all over. So I'm just going to, you'll find me in your yard like Peter Rabbit. <laughs> oh, it'll, be, it'll be the Enroths, not the rabbits eating all our stuff. That's right. <laughs> <It'll be us. laughs> yes. How do you control the Enroths? <laughs> You bake us into a pie, or you bake us a pie, and that distracts us from the actual healthy food. So, yeah. So, well, uh, Katie, Ken, I know um, both of us in our our humble abodes of which we all reside, and uh, respectively, we have our own lawns that we take care of. And um, I myself have not really paid much attention to our lawn aside from picking up sticks so far this year. I don't know, Katie, have you been uh, hard at work in the lawn? Well, um, we, <laughs> Matt, Matt's, uh, used to work in the golf course industry. And so our lawn is, uh, looking like a golf course right now. He, um, we tore out some landscaping and reseeded that area. We've trapped three moles. Um, we aerated, we overseeded, we rolled it. We, uh, he's done it all. So, wow. It's just well, a competition between he and our neighbor. Uh huh. Yes, yes. Um, then Ken and I will be over later on today <laughs> to rate those yards. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> but I think ultimately it's Richard who who could rate him. Oh my goodness. Well, I mean, I think so. Um, Katie, you are now going to have to be taking over, I think, for Richard. So let's let's go ahead and introduce Richard to the show. So Richard, welcome to the podcast once again. I just say welcome back. Thank you. It's good to good to be back on air, so to speak. Here, well, we are going to talk about this uh, here towards the end of the show. But but your retirement is is upcoming. Did you know that Katie is uh, uh, so lawn uh, so lawn crazy? Uh, not crazy, but so lawn. How, what's the proper word, Katie? Oh, tell me. High level of crazy. high level of management as, uh, the high, as, <laughs> as as what I would put her lawn. High level of management. There we go. I like that. I like that. So, Katie. <laughs> Um, you're taking over for Richard. That's that's how it's. Oh, going I to still go. rely on Richard. He's a great resource. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you uh, again, Richard, for being oh. here uh, today to talk about the our topic of this week, which is lawns. And so, Ken, would you mind kicking us off with uh, our line of questions for this week? I can do that. Uh, so, lawn culture, as Katie has talked about, for a lot of people, is is pretty strong in the United States. Uh, do you know how much lawns, how much lawn we have in the U.S., how much kind of acreage or anything like that? Well, it's it's really um, gone up from a, a number I would have shared <clears throat> with master gardeners even f five years ago. 
the the uh, National Turfgrass Research Initiative really estimates it right now at about 50 million acres in the United States, of which about 31 million of those acres are actually irrigated. Uh, when we look at those kinds of acre numbers, um, turf grass, if it was a crop, comes out at about number four. So it's, it's, it's there. Every time you see a new subdivision pop up, think turf grass. What does it take away? Crop. So uh, turf is an increasing um, crop, if you will, has just gone up as the more and more subdivisions have been, been developed. Of course, we had a lull during uh, the building recession, but if you look around now, you're seeing things start to happen again. So that number is very likely to, uh, likely to grow. So yeah, we have substantial acres in turf grass throughout the United States. Uh, a lot of times, the public looks at golf courses and big green areas as part of the problem, not part of the solution when it comes to uh, fertilizer use and all those other things. But really, um, that commercial green area really only makes up about 15 or 20 percent of all those acres. So it's really the homeowners, you, I, our, our four or five yards here as we're on air. Um, what we do really is influential in the environment. So what we do in our little yards does make a big difference. So within our yards, uh, there's a lot of different conditions that we can experience. Some areas can be sun or shade. Uh, some areas can have good or bad drainage. Are there basic needs that a lawn um, can have so that we can have a, a lush lawn without inputs? Well, if we all lived in the, had the ideal world and the ideal setting, it would be great if our lawns got full sun, given the kind of grasses we typically grow. Um, drainage would be great if we, if we have that, and that varies by soil types, anywhere from tight, heavy clays down to sandy, loamy soils that the water just disappears as soon as it shows up on the surface. Um, I think one of the things that we can do a better job of is uh, what's under our, really within our control and that be, might be uh, grass seed selection, uh, the kind of sod that we purchase, if that's the case, they need to be adaptable to the site, um, especially for sun shade, uh, because you put full sun grass seed into a shady location or sod into a shady location and it might look good for a month once it's up. But after that, it just starts to decline. It's the wrong environment for those. So in the shadier locations, we are limited to really seed because you can't grow sod in a, in, a, in a shade setting. It's all out there in the full sun. So shade grasses pretty much are, by, are by, going to be done by seed. You're looking at the fescues. You're looking at um, the perennial rye grasses. Um, you also need to understand that shade grasses have no strong physical tolerance, so they don't stand up to traffic very well. And if you've got that kind of a grass in your yard already, you know that just mowing it sometimes beats it up. Uh, so it's uh, nice to look at, it's not tolerant of the tree swing and the rope and the tire. Um, it'll just go away very quickly or underneath the slide set or the swing set in the yard. It just doesn't, it really doesn't stand up. So. The conditions you have really will make a difference on what you sow and then that is part of our management program understanding that uh, uh, that's not going to be the best place to put the swing set um, out in the full sun would be a better location where the grasses can tolerate the traffic so those are the beginnings of some in the shade or you've got heavy soils you have to be real careful about watering Shady areas don't dry out very quickly and it's very easy to waterlog and root the rots, uh, rot the roots. How's that? Is that a better phrase? <laughs> uh, so there's lots of things that go into this, but good grass seed is a great place to start and combine that with knowing the conditions you have uh, is a great way to begin. This is so, this is something that I've been seeing pop up more and more. I don't know if, because I haven't necessarily, I haven't paid attention before, but I've noticed a lot of annual ryegrass popping up in Illinois uh, grass seed aisles. Now, I know annual rye is sometimes overseeded in a warm season lawn in the southern U.S. to keep it green in the wintertime. Now, I, I don't, and, and annual rye, maybe that's something that we could use for erosion control here for a quick 
uh, thing. But but as you mentioned, like selecting good quality seed, I, I maybe this is a cautionary statement for some listeners like, hey, make sure you read that grass seed label and you can identify those species because that annual rye doesn't last very long at all. So yeah, I don't, if, is that something that you see up in your neck of the woods? Not real strong, but I, I know, let's say on the golf course side of things, uh, annual rye is just a, an obnoxious problem that they have because it comes and goes in the season and, and it, and it reseeds. So you really never, if you will, get rid of it. So I agree with you. Annual rye is something you'd want to sow with extreme caution because it just is not going to go away. So if you sowed annual rye in with bluegrass to get a nurse crop, chances mm -hmm. are the annual rye will be a problem down the road. If, if that's, um, again, management style, if you don't mind annual rye every year in your lawn, fine, but pretty much most of us don't as we grow lawns today, right now anyway. So yeah, you would want to be very careful. Um, I think it's probably showed up to some extent because people have talked about using it as a cover crop in the vegetable garden or something like that. And mm -hmm. then the consumer buys it not understanding annual rye versus perennial rye. Um, so when I have the opportunity and we're talking about a cover crop in the veg veggie garden or, or uh, growing beds or raised beds, I always stress if you're going to do it, at least get perennial rye. Um, and uh, you want to get it out of those beds, be of course, before it goes to seed and all, but at least perennial rye is an acceptable rye in your lawn. Mm -hmm. So yes, there's there, uh, a good one. Yes, the shot over your shoulder is a warning shot. Good, good comment. I've just started reading those grass seed labels more thoroughly these days, and I'm just kind of surprised at the amount of um, maybe not high quality seed in certain things. And it, it, the label will tell you, yeah. Yeah, just read the label. You've got uh, percentages of noxious weeds. You've got inert mat inert matter. You've got uh, wheat actual you know percentage weed seed, not even noxious weed, but weed seed content in that label. Um, you're hoping to get some sort of a hybrid disease resistant seed, and um, the phrase "you get what you pay for" is pretty straightforward when it comes to grass seed. Mm -hmm. You only need, give or take, a pound or so per thousand square feet to sow a lawn. So while that one bag might be $25 and the other is 10, uh, you may get a better, bigger bang for your buck by buying the $25 bag because you're getting high quality material there. Uh, great on greater germination rate too. A lot of times, um, that, not a lot of times, that's also something by law needs to be on the label is percentage of germination. So why, why pay for a bag that only gives you 50% germination and is full of inert matter and, and weed seed? You mm -hmm. wanna go the other way and get it up there in the 80, 90, 95% germination percentages. Even if it contains some other stuff we really don't want, the grass seed, there's enough grass germinating, it really helps to out compete those weeds that might sprout out of the bag. So yeah, you get what you pay for. Well. I, I guess being springtime here in Illinois, um, what are some of the lawn tasks? Now, I am the typical homeowner, so unlike Katie and Matt, I am not, I am not uh, going to be completing all of those tasks this spring. Um, so let's say, Richard, typical lawn owner, I fertilize once a year. I'll try to aerate sometime this year, maybe. I don't know. Um, but I do oversee routinely. Um, we're talking cool season lawns here. Um, what should we be doing right now in our lawns? And, and also, I'm sure you'll mention this too, Illinois is a very long state. There's a lot Absolutely. happening north to south. There, there's more than four weeks of difference between uh, northern Illinois to southern Illinois. Mm -hmm. So in southern Illinois, we've already been, been mowing probably. And prior to that, we were out picking up the sticks and the debris maybe doing some hand raking to uh, pull the grass upright again that might have been matted down from the winter weather, from traffic, from um, uh, 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 waterlogged soils, from rains and things of that sort. Um, and so in Southern Illinois, mowing has been there and I hope, and this applies from Southern Illinois to Northern Illinois right now, I hope lawn mowers have been cleaned up. The decks underneath got rid of the caked on grass from last year. Uh, the mower blades have been sharpened. 
um, and the consideration of maybe notching up the mowing height, maybe just one notch on the lawnmower um, is at least a good thought. Try it for a while. If you don't like it, you can always go back down, um, but uh, taller grass blades uh, produce more energy for the plant. Uh, they shade the soil so you have less weed seed germination. And about 98% of our weeds, by the way, germinate in the spring. So the sooner you get that grass up there to a higher level, the more shading it provides. And the taller grass then uh, helps conserve moisture by keeping the sun off the soil. So there's some benefits from the, the higher grass and the sharp mower blades for sure. Um, uh, so mowing in initially is what's there. In terms of frequency and is, you know, grasses have two flushes a year, the spring flush and the late summer fall flush of growth. And in the spring, we see it. It's the growth above ground. The fall flush is really more about uh, fulfilling the needs of the root system for the upcoming winter than top growth. So in the springtime, our mowing frequency may be every fourth or fifth day, slowing down to maybe once a week, which is our typical routine. Um, the the uh, need to mow it as often as necessary, again, is a function of how well the lawn is going to manage uh, weed competition and things like that. If we cut off too much at any one time while the lawn still is green, it might sit there for a day or two before it starts to grow again. And in that one or two or three day period gives that weed, which isn't going to slow down, a chance to grow uh, and uh, outcompete the lawn, and it should be the other way around, really. Um, late, and, and in terms of if we're going to fertilize, we normally want to extend that natural spring flush. Uh, so we don't want to put it on first thing because we may be mowing every three or four days to keep up with our mowing efforts and the one third rule. Um, we want to put it on as our natural flush starts to slow so that we're extending the greening period. And I'm referring here to essentially synthetic uh, lawn products, the typical bags of fertilizer we buy. I, I might have commented on the show a few weeks ago. I uh, maybe or maybe not, but I did see um, a couple folks. This was in February when we had a spell of warm weather, applying a quick release fertilizer to their dormant lawns. And so I, uh, boy, that's all going into the lake. Yeah, <laughs> that, know? That, that didn't go anywhere. Yeah. Uh, I've seen lawn care companies out and, 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 and God bless them for what they do for the folks that really want that kind of level of care. And the other side of that is that there's an obligation, kind of an unwritten obligation that when they do their stuff, we're supposed to have our half too. So we need to, need to do it together. And I think timing is a big deal. I, I have seen some industry folks out, what I perceive is put, probably putting down uh, pre-emergent crabgrass control and maybe a spring fertilization and chris you're right it's it's the wrong time for one of those the pre-emergent might be timely if it lasts long enough but to put down the, an early spring fertilization is uh, uh kind of questionable when the lawns have barely even started to grow so speaking of <clears throat> turf growing and mowing uh recently there's been a lot of kind of a push for a no mow may so the idea is you don't mow your lawn uh, for pollinators for any weeds that may be in there so they can bloom and and whatnot what are your thoughts on that on the no mow may well they've they've uh entered uh, i agree i've just seen it in the probably the last three to four weeks stories about this and it's you really ask have to ask yourself uh if you already have a weed free lawn there's no point because there aren't any weeds in your yard that are going to feed the pollinators so we're really uh, the folks that have a, essentially a high level of maintenance in their yard or management styles in their yard and their yard is 100% weed free, there's no point in not mowing your lawn in May. There's, you're not going to be giving the pollinators anything to, to feed upon, even if you choose not to mow. The, the folks that this might be a consideration for will be those that have a much anywhere, well, any amount of weeds other than zero, uh, there might be the consideration. So if your lawn is, as they say, full of dandelions and creeping Charlie and the other kinds of weeds that are there, those weeds will provide uh, pollinators with an energy source, with a food source. Uh, the biggest one, of course, is the yellow dandelion. Uh, lots and lots has been shared about 
insects and their and pollinators and other insects as, as the dandelion is some of the earlier food sources we might be able to provide them. So um, that's kind of the, my opinion, the decision factor here. If you have a relatively weed-free lawn, uh, there, it makes no sense not to mow it in May other than you get behind on your mowing and have to recapture your lawn after all that, which might send out other issue might give you other issues to deal with uh, the amount of grass clippings you have to at that point uh, collect rake up and do something with um, uh, the fact that uh, the lawn is so tall at that point that there's an awful lot of moisture hiding lurking underneath and that might lead to some earlier disease problems so uh, for those folks that have a, um, a less than optimal lawn that that is a choice uh, one that uh, may, people may be okay with or not. I like how you put that, Richard, recapturing your lawn after that, because that's what comes to my mind. So if you let it go, that's fine. And I have plenty of Creeping Charlie and Dandelions, and the violets in my lawn are beautiful. Um, but if I let it go, I have to do a lot more work afterwards to recapture that. Raking sure. excessive clippings. Um maybe the creeping charlie gets going into the landscape beds where i don't want it um i don't know yeah so i i, I like how you put that there there's you have to think about what happens at the end of may too yeah you you got to start to mow eventually mm -hmm. um this might be more suitable in your backyard than your front yard because yes. a lot of there's city and township ordinances about how long you can let your lawn go uh so it's not uncommon once it gets say hits that six eight inch category uh, someone might send out a complaint you might be you know you might be fined by the by the by the by the city or whatever or they might come out and mow the lawn for you and then bill you uh, so it's again it's just a decision it's a it's an environmental decision it's your decision uh, maybe if you have a yard that is full of pollinator gardens you're okay by not by by going ahead and mowing your lawn even if the there are weeds in it because you've provided an energy source for the the wildlife otherwise so again it's going to be a personal choice and this is the first year i've heard about this so i'm guessing it's going to be a campaign that shows up every year now um, the other trend that we hear so often is less lawn and more flowers which is feeding the pollinator so we'll see how this plays out I perceive an environmental and a horticultural battle ensuing uh, as this moves forward. What about dandelion control? Um, is this something that we should do in the spring or is there a better time for us to uh, try to control these weeds? Well, um, given our previous discussion just now on uh, no mo may, let me follow that up. Um, if you're, if, if you're tolerant of a few dandelions in your yard, uh, just not doing anything is, is most appropriate. Um, uh, when you do a dandelion control in May, what you're really controlling are the dandelions that made it through last summer and are back to visit us this spring. Um, and if you only ever treat in, in the spring because the flower is there, you'll never get rid of dandelions in your turf because dandelions will germinate and sprout throughout the summer. And so you will always have dandelions back the coming spring. If you truly want to get rid of dandelions, a late uh, summer, late summer, early fall kind of an application will catch all the ones that were there in the spring anyway, plus all the ones that sprouted and grew during the current growing season. The following spring, you really won't have dandelions to be concerned with. And as it relates to pollinators, if you wait till fall, okay, you you fed them all summer, you take care of them in the fall, you won't have dandelions in your yard to attract them in. They'll just naturally look for other sources of energy in other yards and other plants. So it's not like you're taking away their 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 energy source uh, by making a fall application because they won't be there in the spring. You're not going to be taking anything away from them at that point. So Fall is a, a most adequate time. I mean, the better time, if you will, to get, if you want more or more thorough dandelion control, make your treatments in the, make your treatments in the, in the fall. And I also have to say that isn't how the media and the ads out there are, are selling dandelion control products. They want you out there when the spring bloom is there. That's their marketing tactic. 
Are there any alternative ways that we can um, get rid of dandelions without using herbicides or are there any organic herbicides that we can use to get rid of them? Okay, well, you know, in past decades past, we would have things like clover and other desirable broadleaf weeds, if you will, in the lawn. First, uh, post World War II, uh, when the phenoxy compounds became uh, available to us as a homeowner after the defoliation efforts during World War II, um, they realized that not only could we control, say, the broad leaf weeds and, and, and the clover in our lawn, uh, our lawn seed mixes began to change. But more to, your, uh, but more to your question, most of these products are synthetic products that are focused on broad leaf weeds, which leaves your monocots or your grasses alone. And that's why these treatments can be selective. The only organic product I'm really familiar with has been the evolution of uh, gluten, corn gluten, which has been a byproduct of the ethanol industry making gas for our vehicles. Um, while this does have some pre-emergence as well as post-emergence control, the, the uh, precautionary tale is that corn gluten also contains nitrogen. So if you're going to use this to do any weed controlling in your lawn, you also have to think about that in terms of your total amount of nitrogen you're adding to your lawn in your lawn maintenance product or program uh, for the year. It has been effective in uh, some years more so than others, which suggests timing is critical as most organic treatments have been versus a synthetic product that has a known half-life, if you will. It's, you put it on, you know it's gonna be there for X amount of time where organic products, um, they can be very effective in some years and not so much in others because of when it gets put on based upon the timing of uh, the weed growth cycle. So while the, some exist, uh, they're, they haven't been, um, they haven't been consistent in their results. So we have a chat, we have a choice. We, if dandelions were just a few in your yard and you wanted to make spot treatment, say, uh, perhaps a better chance of making controls than say a broadcast throughout the yard. So they, some of them do exist. Their effectiveness is questionable. Well, Richard, changing gears here. We oh, mentioned sure. at the top of the show, retirement is a lumen. Um, and so this is something that we've done with other educators that have retired. We've had them on the show and we've asked them a couple of questions. And this is really important for us because, you know, when I'm 92 years old and I'm able to retire at that point in time, I, I need to have this advice to get me from now up until that point. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you're able to say la vie and still have many, many, many decades uh, where you can enjoy life. I, I hope Ken, Katie, and I are able to replicate the same, same thing. I don't know, though. We'll find out. It, again, we might be in our 90s when we're able to do this. So, um, But Richard, I first question, what was your favorite part of the job? Well, I think, Chris, before I answer that, the best advice you need to really get is how, how to get to 92. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then, <laughs> then what to do after 92, I, I might be able to help with. But to, but to answer your question, I, I, what I have really enjoyed doing has been really teaching, whether it's adults, master gardeners, uh, civic organizations, garden clubs, whoever they might be, um, sharing the knowledge. People are just thrilled to learn and to improve their yards or improve their lifestyle. So the idea of teaching and sharing knowledge has really been great. Um, working with extension staff at any level has also been uh, uh, invaluable to me because um, the, there are, there's lots of stuff I certainly don't know or don't know the detail of or the strong history of, and that comes from other educators um, in, in Illinois, uh, surrounding states, wherever that knowledge is, and I can reach out and and, uh, and they're willing to share, that's, that's been really, uh, really maybe the highlights in terms of, of my career, being able to teach and share knowledge. All right, so a lot of times 
people around the state, I say myself included, have leaned on you for your turf knowledge, um, as well as other stuff, ornamentals. And we've, you and I have done stuff with master gardener training for disease and disease diagnosis. Um, but as far as kind of gardening stuff, what is your favorite yard or garden task at home? Well, as odd as this is going to sound, I really like getting down there and working on my plants, you know, hands and knees, edging, um, deadheading. I think the, the more time you spend in close proximity to your plants, the more you learn about their needs and care and culture. Um, as you mentioned, disease wise, uh, it's so easy to pick up on a disease that's just starting versus one that's already overtaken your plant. There's a chance of doing something. Insect feeding is the same way. Uh, you don't have to wait till the tomato hornworm is three inches long before you do something with it. They actually start out kind of not much bigger than the size of a pinhead. So if you're out there and watching and managing closely, uh, that's great. So working the soils, edging, uh, the, the, the deadheading, just keeping the garden soils loose, you know, those kinds of things. I, I enjoy that aspect of it. Um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, all of us just see uh, what's wrong with my plants. I get to enjoy the time. I get to see all the good stuff. And then sometimes that's just in my own yard. Uh, I can, I can pull the people right here, right now. How many of you have gotten a phone call that says you should come to my yard. It's just beautiful. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Nobody. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's, you know, you got to see the beauty um, problems exist certainly, but you got to see the beauty. So I like really working hands, hands-on effort in my own, uh, in my own yard, landscape beds, perennial beds, veggies. Uh, that's what I enjoy most myself. Yeah. I, sometimes I see so many problems throughout the day. I can't, um, go to a garden center and, um, buy anything. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> I see too many problems. The expectations are different when you know what it should be. To know what's available you're right you want to if you buy it you at least want to know you can recover it or repair it or modify mm -hmm. the planting so that these things are going to live sure i agree how about a favorite memory richard that happened while working with illinois extension <laughs> well there, there there are a couple stories that uh, have, have never left my my <laughs> storytelling days and one of them is on turf and the other is on uh, fruit trees the one on turf is and this was before we had pretty much internet and images and photographs to share and things to look up um, and the call came in it was so bizarre i kind of took the drive out to look and the gentleman was talking about these very perfectly round circles in his lawn that would come and they'd appear in one place and then they disappear and show back up in another and uh, I thought, well, I'm thinking, okay, maybe dollar spot or something like that. But when I got there from the front yard, looking off the street to his lawn, as he described it, these spots would come and go, they'd disappear. And uh, which was, okay, something's going on here. And it was an opportunity to be in the yard. And I kind of walked around and up his driveway and I looked and these spots were parallel with the wheel tire marks on his lawnmower. And back then you didn't have all the OSHA safety things that when you stopped your lawnmower that the engine would quit. So he'd stop the mower, the engine would run, he'd empty the bag and start mowing again. While he was doing that, the exhaust, which was pointed downwards in the mower deck, burnt that two inch spot. And yeah, they'd go away because they didn't kill the grass plant, he just toasted the foliage. So that was one in turf that I'll, I'll never forget. So the magical disappearing and reappearing rings was nothing more than the kind of lawnmower he had and, and how he was managing his lawn by catching the clippings. And the other fruit tree story is, uh, uh, and these still occur even today, you get the calls about, I've had my fruit tree in for five years. It's never given me any fruit, what's going on. And, and my question has always been, and there's always a quiet lull after I ask the question, I ask him, has it ever flowered? Because you can't have fruit, of course, without the flower. So that's been my very first question. So those those two things always come come to mind when we talk about odd or or funny stories uh, in the job or on the job. Well, Richard, I think one of the things that helps us out with this job are the resources that we have kind of at our disposal. Also, the things that we found that we've sort of compiled, and uh, we were talking before the show about cleaning out file cabinets and things like that. And we're all amassing these, I don't know, paperwork, whether it's physical paper or a digital paper, uh, 
research paper, all, all of that stuff. But what would you say would be a, a good resource for us educators as we go out into the future? Well, I'd like to think uh, Illinois has had a, a pretty strong history in, in horticulture. And I know I will, without question, rely upon the rest of the horticulture educators on our state horticulture team. And, and with that, that has to include the, our state specialists um, who have a, a, a bigger background sometimes in some of the very specific questions we get and they've been invaluable. I don't have a problem with, and over the years, you know, you, you, you meet people, you become acquaintances, you on a professional level, uh, I reach out routinely to specialists or other educators in our surrounding states, whether it's Iowa or Michigan or Indiana, uh, Missouri. Um, these are all states that have horticulture, and there's usually someone there that has a topic of interest to me that I need to get information on, and I will certainly rely on those. Because of my background being in the green industry area uh, prior to the current position, you know, again, I, I, you should get to know and introduce yourself to some of the, the green industry folks, the Illinois landscape contractors, the IGIA, which is Illinois Green Industry Association, which is essentially the nursery folks, um, ILCA, which is Illinois landscape contractors. Uh, they work with the people that really have the feet on the ground. They're out there doing this work. And uh, they go to great strides to make sure their members are educated and, and uh, I can glean pra practical information from them as, as well. So it's, uh, as the expression goes, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And uh, you should not be afraid to reach out and uh, learn from these other individuals, whether they're in, in extension or otherwise, because uh, they've got a pulse on the industry too. So I use everybody. Well, Richard, I know you're are going to be missed. Uh, your name is going to be popping up <laughs> throughout the coming decades still as we're teaching classes. And uh, your mowing mantra, which has been burned into my brain, I can't teach class without saying it practically. Mow high, mow often, and keep those blades sharp. Um, I have a tattooed on the- um, I, I don't want to know yeah. where you have a oh, tattoo. Oh, 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 right, right, right. Yes. I, I'd probably have to show it. That'd be awkward. We wouldn't be able to post this episode. Yep. So yep. yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that, that would be, that would be strange. So I wouldn't want to send you out on that. <laughs> on that <laughs> note. Good. Yeah. Well, th Richard, thank you so much for, for being here on the show and for everything that you've done in your career with Illinois Extension. We really appreciate everything you've given us. Yeah. Thank you so much. Extension has provided me just a great career. I'm grateful and thankful for that and knowing everybody right here on this program and it reaches out far beyond. So I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Well, the Good Growing Podcast is produced by Wendy Ferguson this week, edited by me, Chris Enroth. And a special thank you to our co-host with us every single week, Katie Parker, Ken Johnson. Thank you, guys. Yes, thank you, Richard, for joining us one last time and enjoy your retirement. And Chris right. and Ken, don't plan on retiring before next week. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again richard for being on and, and congrats on the retirement oh, yeah. thank you chris and katie always fun and uh, let's do this again next week oh we shall do this again next week we're going to be talking with one of our communications and marketing managers on campus and we're going to talk about why are we even here in your ears or being beamed into your eyeballs what is extension <laughs> what are we doing here and <laughs> And, and, and why do we enjoy this so much? So listeners, thank you for doing what you do best. And that is listening. If you're watching us on YouTube, watching. And as always, keep on growing. I got to say, you know, as we as I leave here, um, I think uh, good growing uh, has really stepped up. Um, I, you know, I did a lot of little individual videos over the years and, and I believe it or not, there was enough bloopers that they made a blooper reel <laughs> and they showed it yesterday during my reception. So everyone oh, that goes awesome. out on the air has a blooper reel apparently. Mm -hmm. So won't be famous because of them, but it's there. So anyway, uh, congrats on the good growing com uh, podcast. I think this is the place extension needs to be. So. Um, Thank you. And we have been already congratulating that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you guys take care. Right. Thanks, right. Richard. Bye -bye. Uh -huh. Thank you, Richard.
Thank you for tuning into CUI's TV. We hope you enjoyed the show. This video can be accessed anytime on youtube.com. In the YouTube search bar, type in UPTV6 and look for their microphone logo. We hope you will join us again next week for more local, engaging content designed specifically for Champaign County older adults. Take care and stay safe.